All right, we're going to start with our next lab, Lab 9, dealing with heart anatomy. This is on page 45 of your lab packet, <clears throat> looking at the heart as an organ. The first slide that we see um, has a picture of cardiac muscle tissue as we would look at it under a microscope. And um, this is in chapter 3 of your textbook of the tissues. But we can see that cardiac muscle cells are striated. They have those vertical lines on them, just like we saw with skeletal muscle. But there's also these extra lines, these real dark vertical lines. Those are called intercalated discs. And those are unique to, to, sorry, to cardiac muscle tissue. It helps to hold those cells together and helps to transfer action potentials very quickly so when the heart has to contract all the cells contract as a unit. So these intercalated discs are very important for cardiac muscle function and we don't see those in skeletal muscle or in smooth muscle. Also notice that the cells of cardiac muscle are branched. They're not parallel cells all running in the same direction um, right next to one another. We see that these cells are branched. That's another unique characteristic of cardiac muscle tissue. If we look at the heart as a whole organ then, we see some uh, major features, which is it's pointed at the bottom, and that narrow tip of the heart at the bottom we call the apex. So this is the apex of the heart. And when the heart muscle contracts, when the ventricles contract to pump blood, that contraction starts at the apex. The base of the heart is at the top portion of the heart, and that's the wider portion here, just below the vessels. So we're not talking about the top, including the vessels. We're talking about the top of the heart where the vessels begin. So we're talking about this top wider portion. This is called the base of the heart. So the base, think of the heart like an upside down triangle where the base is up here at the top and the peak or the narrow portion, the apex, is down here at the bottom. On the surface of the heart, there's two types of vessels, ones that carry fresh oxygenated blood to the heart muscle tissue, and we call those the coronary arteries. If a person gets a clot in these coronary arteries, that's what we call a heart attack. So the coronary arteries supply fresh oxygenated blood to the, the heart muscle, and these coronary arteries um, are branches off of the aorta. So this is freshly oxygenated blood coming to the heart muscle. And then the vessels that receive the deoxygenated used blood from the heart muscle cells, those are called cardiac veins. And in a model, they're going to always be stained blue. So the blue vessels are the cardiac veins. The red vessels are the coronary arteries. We also see some major vessels that drain or feed the heart. So first of all, we'll talk about the, the vessels that we find in the atria, because the atria are the receiving chambers for blood coming into the heart. So the atria are always going to have um, veins associated with them because veins carry blood to the heart. So these veins carry blood to the atria. So the right atrium is this flap of tissue on the upper right portion of the heart here. This is the right atrium. So we have blood returning to the heart from the head and neck through the superior vena cava. So this blue vessel here at the top of the right atrium is the superior vena cava. And then the vessel that drains everything below that is the inferior vena cava down here. And that feeds also into the right atrium. We can't see it here on this side of the heart, but it does feed into the right atrium. So we have the superior vena cava on top and the inferior vena cava on the bottom. And because these are carrying blood to the heart, they are veins and they are colored blue in this case because they're carrying used blood from the body back to the heart into the right atrium. The next vessel is the aorta. The aorta receives blood from the left ventricle. So the left ventricle is here on the left lower side of the heart here. This is the left ventricle. And when that chamber contracts, it sends blood into the aorta, which is the largest artery in the body, the aorta. It has these three vessels coming off the top. And because this is freshly oxygenated blood in this vessel, it is a red vessel and it is um, an artery. It's the aorta. The pulmonary artery is the blood that carries, or is the vessel that carries the blood away from the right ventricle. So think of the ventricles as pumping blood away from the heart, so they are going to have arteries associated with them. So the pulmonary artery is shown here. The pulmonary artery is blue because the blood hasn't been to the 
lungs yet to pick up oxygen. So we use blue to indicate oxygenation or not when we're looking at models and pictures of the heart or the blood vessels. But truly blood is never blue. Blood is either dark red or bright red. Dark red if it's low in oxygen, bright red if it's high in oxygen. But we use in our models and diagrams, we use blue and red just to help us see the difference between the vessels. So this is the pulmonary artery leading from the right ventricle and notice that it branches left and right to serve each lung. The pulmonary veins are best seen on the back side of the heart. They lead to the left atrium, because remember, atrium, the atria are the receiving chambers of the heart, so they are going to have veins bringing blood to the heart and to the atria. And in this case, the left atrium has the pulmonary veins that bring blood to it. So if we look at the back side of the heart here, we can see the four pulmonary veins that are leading to the left atrium. So this flap here on the left side is the left atrium. And this is the right atrium. Remember we said the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava lead to the right atrium. So that's what these two veins are draining into, is into the right atrium. And these four pulmonary veins are feeding into the left atrium. Now we'll review these again when we look at a cross section of the heart. We can see these same vessels. Here's the chamber of the right atrium. There's the superior and inferior vena cava. And then we see this large chamber below the right atrium, which is the right ventricle. And there's a valve between these two chambers, and this is called the right AV valve. And you can always tell the AV valves in the heart because they have these cords or tendons that attach to them and tether them down to the walls of the ventricle. So this is the right AV valve, and if we go over to the left side of the heart, this is the left AV valve, this white set of structures here. And that prevent both of the valves, all of the valves in the heart, prevent backflow of blood. So as blood is coming in through the superior vena cava into the right atrium, it goes down to the ventricles, and then this valve closes so that blood doesn't go back up into the atria where it came from. Then when the ventricles contract, the blood goes into the arteries that drain the ventricles. So the right ventricle has the pulmonary artery attached to it. So here is the pulmonary valve at the base of the pulmonary artery. The left ventricle has the aorta that drains or that carries blood from that left ventricle. So when the left ventricle contracts, here's the valve at the base of the aorta that's going to close to prevent blood flow back into the ventricles once that blood enters the aorta. So these are cup-like structures, these um, pulmonary and aortic valves, when you look in a model where these have the strings attached, and remember those are the left and right AV valves. And remember when you're looking at the heart, you're thinking of it as your patient lying on or standing in an anatomical position. So this is the left side of the heart, and this is the right side of the heart. And we'll always notice that the left side of the heart, this wall here, is thicker than the right side because this, is, this chamber is pumping to the body, so it needs to be very muscular. And this chamber is pumping to the lungs, which are pretty close to the heart, so it doesn't require as much pressure to get that blood to that location. So it's a thinner walled chamber. So we don't have to worry about the layers of the heart. Um, that's not in your objectives, but this is just an extra picture where you can do some extra labeling of valves or of the different vessels or the chambers. So again, we have the right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle, the left, I'm sorry, the right AV valve, the left AV valve, the pulmonary valve, and the aortic valve. Then we have the pulmonary veins on either side here. We have the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, aorta, pulmonary artery. And this little piece coming down here is actually the, an extension of the aorta because the aorta goes up and then it dips down and travels behind the heart. And that's what that is down there, is just a continuation of that aorta as it descends down into the rest of the body. And we'll learn about that in the lab on blood vessels. So the next slide talks about the cardiac conduction system. When cells need to contract in the heart, they are stimulated by special cells in the heart we call autorhythmic cells, which means they can generate their own action potential. They don't need the nervous system to stimulate them to contract or to generate an action potential. So in this case, these actually, these cells don't contract. They just generate uh, 
action potentials throughout the heart. So the first cluster of cells here is in the roof of the right atrium and it's called the SA node. So when that fires off an action potential, that travels to the left atrium as well as traveling down the right atrium and then those atria will contract shortly after the SA node fires. Then the next part of the conduction pathway is the AV node and this is on the floor of the right atrium, the AV node. And this one can also conduct the action potentials, but it does it at a slower rate. So the SA node is the boss when it comes to setting the rate for the heart because it has the, the fastest rhythm or rate of action potential generation. So we have the SA node in the roof of the right atrium. We have the AV node in the floor of the right atrium. Then it travels down the middle of the heart, down the septum that divides the two ventricles. And we see this where it, just before it branches. This is called the bundle of Hiss, this region right here before it branches into two areas. Then these two branches running down the middle are called the bundle branches coming down the middle wall of the heart, bundle branches and then going up the sides are the Purkinje fibers. Going up both sides are the Purkinje fibers. So those are where the ventricles are going to receive their information to contract is when these generate action potentials from the SA node as it travels down the pathway then the ventricles will contract. And the ventricles always contract starting at the apex and moving upward toward the base. That kind of allows good squeezing of blood out through the pulmonary artery and the aorta when we see contraction starting at the apex. So in your, text, in your lab packet on page 47, there's some labeling for you to do. The picture on the upper left-hand corner um, is just uh, an opportunity for you to label the major chambers. So just label the two atria and the two ventricles in that upper right-hand picture. On page 47 on the upper right-hand, um, that's a good one for labeling valves and vessels and color coding red and blue to help you uh, remember what's what. And on the bottom of page 47, that's the conduction system. So just number one through five with the different um, parts of the conduction system that we just talked about. And there's also nice pictures in your textbook of this diagram too that is labeled for you. The ECG or EKG stands for electrocardiogram and this measures the electrical activity as these events are occurring in the conduction pathway. So this first deflection here, the small bump in an EKG wave pattern is called the P wave and we see this bump on the on the EKG when the atria are depolarizing. That means that action potential has just begun in the atria and the atria are preparing to contract. So this P wave is what this is called and it means the atria are getting ready to contract. Then we have this small dip down here of this very narrow complex which is called the QRS complex. So this is called the Q portion of this complex. So we label this part Q. This portion here is the R portion. So this is the R and down here is the S portion where it dips down again. So we have the Q, the R, and the S. So together we call this the QRS complex and this whole thing represents the ventricles depolarizing which means they're being stimulated by the conduction pathway to get ready to contract. So the ventricles depolarizing is what the QRS complex represents. And then this last bump, the T wave, is when the ventricles are repolarizing which means they're getting ready to relax. So they were depolarizing and contracting here with the QRS and then they are relaxing as those cells repolarize. And remember when we learned about the action potential that repolarization is when potassium is leaving the cells and it's becoming more negative again. So this is the, the T wave, T as in Tom, representing the ventricles repolarizing. So be sure that you take a look at um, page 47, the bottom of 47, and page 48 and label those waves, label the diagram. You have um, information in your textbook and there's some great homework questions on the Mastering A&P website to really help this all sink in.